Well, I'm Mike Barrett. I am the CEO and founder of Transformation Ministries International. So uh, I'm essentially an evangelist. I'm a revivalist. Um, uh, God sought me out and found me. I used to be a drug addict, used to be a debt collector for drug dealers. And uh, I had an encounter that could only be described as supernatural. Uh, I was looking for answers everywhere um, and I had not found my answers in the world. I had not found my answers in drugs and alcohol and all of these other things. And so I was searching, you know, and I, I found myself one day in a church, a friend of mine had invited me to church and, uh, and it was a church in the midst of a move of God, what we would call a move of God, where many people are like, well, what's a move of God? Well, it was, you could feel something in the place and, uh, and people were really, um, you know, they were happy and they were dancing. And I thought, these people can't all be this happy and not be on something, you know? That was my mentality at the time. Um, but I, I stood in that place and I felt this tangible presence, if you will, this energy hit me from the top of my head down the soles of my feet. The best way I could describe it was like liquid love hit me all at once. And I was like, that was the maddest rush I've ever felt in my life. I nudged a guy beside me. I said, what was that? And he said, what was what? And I described the feeling. He said, oh, that's the Holy Spirit. So that was my journey. I got addicted to the Holy Spirit. And then I began to find out what that was all about and it led me back to the Bible. It led me back to teachings of Jesus and, and, uh, and, and helped me to understand that this Holy Spirit is God's tangible force. It is the third person of the Godhead here on earth. And so I, I, I ran with that. I mean, I, I began to have this personal relationship with this guy called the Holy Spirit who began to teach me and began to lead me in everything. And, Basically, you know, I, this is in 1998 this happened and um, a little church in Surface Paradise and by 1999, I was starting these houses to help drug addicts and alcoholics because they'd encountered this same Holy Spirit that I'd encountered and it was just, but they didn't have these life skills and couldn't sort of get together. So I started these houses and and I had one and that got full and then I ended up with five houses and then it, it became a whole thing where it's evolved into a, a full drug and alcohol uh, rehabilitation facility and discipleship program that is putting people into leadership. We have seen like countless guys and girls traveling the world, sharing their faith, sharing their stories. We've got people who are senior pastors, even in our city that have come through our program and it is just incredible to watch how God has taken these people who somewhat were on the scrap heap of life. And, you know, God's the great recycler, you know, God's the one that sees the, 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 the you know, we see a crushed Coke can, we think it's gone, it's finished, but God sees crushed humanity and he says, no, that can be used again. And, and, and that's where transformations comes in and, 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 the, and, the, and the second state's even better than the former state where these guys and girls are just doing incredible things and changing their worlds and their communities. And so that then caused me to be able to, you know, give that to other churches and, and it expanded. And I started eight new transformations in, in eight years. We were in Kuala Lumpur, Harvey Bay, Brisbane, Gold Coast. Uh, we started one in Bendigo, Victoria, in Melbourne, in Hobart all over the place and, and, and then, uh, you know, we've seen just so many people change by that transformations program right across Australia. So this is, the, I guess, what most people would know me for, especially in Australia, is someone who has been able to really uh, have a program that has changed lives. And, and the essence of that is the power of God. The essence of that is the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, and people who are desperate enough to just, you know, they'll, they'll go after it. So, so uh, you know, as I've done that, you know, and me, be, me predominantly being an evangelist, me predominantly being someone who, uh, you know, 
God has developed in the area of preaching and prophetic and because of my own experience of the tangible touch of God, one of my great passions has been to see people encounter a living God all over the world. And so, you know, God has, by his grace, taken me to many different countries and nations all over the world. I've been, I've preached in America, in Africa, I've preached in the Middle East, I've preached in uh, many different parts of Australia, in the outback, right down Tasmania, uh, to the ends of the earth, to Mexico, to Papua New Guinea, running crusades in Papua New Guinea and over to, to uh, uh, the Philippines and, and right through Southeast Asia. And so uh, it's, I've seen so many different, I've, I've, I've preached in probably about, in prisons in about 10 different nations um, of the world and, and seen the worst of the worst and, and seen them the joy on their faces that come to Christ. Uh, just recently I was preaching in a on a border town in Mexico at one of the immigration centers where there was kids from five years old through to 12 years old that basically tried to sneak across the border or their parents had tried to push them across the border through creeks under buses and trains and they got across the border and they've been picked up and then they put in these basically these prisons and I preached to three lots of 300 kids there. And, and 90% of those people, those kids, received Christ as their saviour. And so I thank God for this incredible diverse ministry. I've also, uh, you know, God has given me favour amongst a lot of the gangsters and outlaws and, and the criminal element and underbelly in Australia. Uh, I led uh, one of the, the major national enforcers of a, an outlaw motorcycle club to the Lord a couple of years ago and um, and just incredible to watch uh, the joy begin to hit his heart and the peace begin to hit, hit his heart and find his passion so 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 this is what this is me I'm Mike Barrett I'm an evangelist I'm a revivalist uh, I go often to churches uh, through Texas uh, through Florida through uh, LA California up through uh, the middle through Alabama, Oklahoma, uh, right down to Louisiana, um, and see uh, churches come into revival. Often we'll do five nights of um, of just you know uh, leading people into a, a great hunger, um, and then uh, you know demonstrating with the gifts of healings and miracles and words of knowledge and the prophetic, and then we lead people from that from God's hand to His face because that's the ultimate. When when you know God. That's what changes everything. And so, yeah, I just wanna, I mean, you know, one of the things I see in the world today is that there is more and more of a shift and more and more of a change uh, in relation to uh, what we're seeing in the agendas of the, in the governments. Now, at one point, uh, Christians would have been labeled as these sort of um, conspiracists, if you will, you know, almost like they've got some kind of mental illness talking about, well, you know, one day we're going to get this chip on in our right hand and our forehead and it'll be called the mark of the beast and we won't be able to buy or sell. You know, we have these doomsday preppers where there's been even shows made out of it where, where people are, are getting ready for the end of the world. You see, there's this innate sense inside each and every one of us, whether you're a Christian, whether you're Buddhist, whether you're Muslim, whether, whatever you are, whether you're an atheist, there's this innate sense that, that there will come a point when we will come to the end of the world. And I think there's a lot of people uh, just waking up at the moment. They're checking, they're going, well, maybe these Christians are right. Maybe this thing called the Bible that has had hundreds of years of prophetic like these prophecies that have come through. And even if you look back to Nostradamus, even Buddha, Buddha actually prophesied some things that are happening now, but, but Christ is the one, he's the one that, and the only one, you won't find his bones in the ground today because he's risen from the dead. You'll find Buddha's bones in the ground. You'll find Muhammad's bones in the ground. You, will, you'll, you won't find Christ's bones in the ground because he's risen from the dead. Jesus Christ is not like any other prophet. Jesus Christ is the son of God. Jesus Christ came and split time. So we have BC and we have AD. There's no one in history that has done that. And Jesus Christ, what he said, what he spoke about in the gospels, he spoke about this time that we're living in even now. 
he spoke about what's all the rumors, wars and rumors of wars. He said, it'll be like the days of Noah where everybody's eating and drinking and they're blinded and they're not knowing what's going on. And then it'll come like a thief in the night. And I guess the word that we're putting out now is get ready. One of the, the cries at the heart of God right now is people get ready, wake up. The government is not your master. Sickness is not your master. The economy is not your master. God's your master. God's your creator. If I've got a problem with my Holden, I take it back to Holden, because they're the creators, they can fix it. If I've got a problem with a human being, I'm gonna take it back to the creator. And here's the truth. Jesus heals all sickness known to man, every sickness. If we would just believe in him, we would be completely free. The problem is, most people say they believe, but do they really believe? But I think what's happening right now is we're living in the day of the black and white. Are you hearing me? There is a great separation where we actually have to choose one side or the other. No longer will there be 50 shades of gray where we can live in this place where we're not choosing what side we're on. Because the narrative and the government and, and, and the powers that be, big pharmacia, uh, a lot of money behind this, you know, whether you want to believe in it or, or not, down the, down the track is the New World Order where there's going to be one money system, there's going to be, that the whole thing's going to converge so that we all come under this government control, so they know where we are, what we're spending, who we're with, I mean, and we're all buying into it now through comfort and convenience. But at some point, because of that control, and I love that really the government is overplaying their hand, really Satan's overplaying his hand at the moment, and Satan's of, of often very deceptive in the way and very subtle in the way. But, you know, the Bible says this, the Bible says he's, he's going faster and faster because he knows his time is short. You see, the end of the world comes at God's timing, not Satan's. The end of the world comes when God decides enough is enough and he steps in. And we've got to choose now. We have to choose completely what we're going to believe. And if we're going to choose Christ, then we have to wholly and solely follow him and his leading. And that comes down to a relationship with him. That comes down to actually asking him to come in and direct us and direct our lives. I think, a lot, I think what, we've, what we've created a lot in, in church is we've, ca we've created churchians rather than Christians. I'll say that again. I think we've created churchians rather than Christians. We haven't discipled people properly where they are actually living fully for God. They've made him Lord of their life and they're listening to the Holy Spirit's leading. Because when push comes to shove, there comes a point where you've got to make a decision. You've got to follow God or follow men. And the book of Isaiah says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. That's what's happening today. That's where this 50 shades of grey. You know, we see it in America, what they call evil good and good evil. You know, and it's all this, oh, well, that's not that, it's not that bad. And, you know, this is okay. And, and it, just, it washes out in the, in the, in the grey area. But the Bible's black and white. It's clear. Thou shalt not kill. So I don't know where you get that whole thing of, uh, oh, well, it's my body, my choice, and I can kill the baby inside me. The Bible is clear. For this reason, a man shall leave his mother, father, and be cleaved unto his wife, woman. God created man and woman. 
to be together. Like, these are black and white topics. There is no gray area in there. Like, uh, look, and I know that, you know, this political correct correctness and this, this shutting of the mouth and this, the religious vilification laws that came in where we're not allowed to say certain things. You think about the mask, you think about what the mask symbolizes. It's shutting our voice. It's, it's, it's muffling our sound. It really is a symbolic thing of what we're, the days we're living in where the voice is being silenced. When I read my Bible, I can see that the first coming of Christ was ushered in by a certain man called John the Baptist. And the Bible says that he was called one who cries out from the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. God is calling out. The Holy Spirit is crying out even now, who will go for me? Who will listen to me and who will be my mouthpiece? Who will be bold enough to stand up and to speak truth and to confront lies? Because the narrative through the media, it's all lies. Come on, you, you've got to know all the lies and propaganda. I mean, I mean, they fit. here's the thing about lies. This is the funny thing about lies, right? When we see in the media, when, when I see someone lie and they're perpetual at lying and they make a habit of lying, they forget the lies they're told. Often when I talk to my kids and you know, they're trying, they, they get, they get, if they're trying to get out of something or they're trying to create this narrative, they get tripped up in their own lies and they forget what they said before. And, you know, like, and, and that's what's happening in the world. The media, the government, they, they, they forget which lie they told to cover this lie, to follow that lie. And, you know, all the tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. And that's what's happening, these lies, and, and, and everybody's awake up to the lies, but the question is, what's the truth? Well, there is one only truth, friend. There's, there's, there's one truth, and his name is Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And he said that in relation of saying, in my father's house, there are many mansions and I go to prepare a place for you. God has prepared a place called heaven for those who believe in him. But for those who reject him, there is a place called hell. Oh, why would a loving God send people to hell? God doesn't send people to hell. We send ourselves to hell because we won't receive the free, wonderful, beautiful gift of grace that God himself came as a man and paid a price we couldn't pay so that we'd be free, friends, but you just got to accept it. It's like an invitation. On every invitation, what does it say at the bottom of the invitation? RSVP. If you don't RSVP, you're not going to party. And God has thrown the biggest party of all time. That's what this is leading up to. Well, at least I know it is for me because I'm a Christian. I know that I love God and I know that he saved me. And so I know that there's a party at the end of all this. And so I don't really, I don't really live for this life. It's like, I'm just, I'm on a working visa. <laughs> and I've RSVP. Friend, you've got to RSVP. You've got to respond to God's love. You've got to respond to God's grace. You've got to say, Jesus, come into my life. I want you, I need you. I need you to guide me and navigate me. And I want to know that I've got an eternity to spend with you instead of worried about what's happening on this world. Oh yeah, our true citizenship is in heaven, but we've got to accept it. Some Christians, their true citizenship, they feel like it's here on this earth. Now, I, 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 for me, I'm on a working visa. For you, maybe you're on a holiday visa, I don't know. And I see this, the comfort, the things of this world, the things of this life. The Bible says that they choke the word out of you. They choke the, they choke the living word out of people. And uh, we're living in a day when it is time to stand up and it's time to decide what you're willing to sacrifice for God. 
what are you willing to put on the altar? Because without a sacrifice, there's no fire. God's willing, God's willing to pour out his fire on, on people to fire them up during this time. But what are you willing personally in your heart to sacrifice? So you don't put a sacrifice in the altar, there's no fire. And we all need to sacrifice to say, God, I'll, I'll, I'll do anything, Jesus. Because we're going to come to this point. In, in Revelation, it says this. That this is what's going to happen in the last days, the revealing of the Antichrist, the false prophet, you know, the mark of the beast. It says that this is how Christians will overcome. Hear me in this. They'll overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. No, but wait, because a lot of Christians stop there. The rest of that passage says, and they'll love not their lives even unto death. They will love not their lives even unto death. Jesus said it like this, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me, otherwise you're not worthy of me. There is coming a time when we need to learn that he is Lord and nothing in this tangible realm and world matters more than the souls of men and eternity. And that's the truth of it. Let me tell you the good news. Let me tell you the good news. We're living in the best times. We are living in harvest times. We are living in a time when all Christians need to do is open their mouth and do what the Bible says, always be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within them. Open their mouths and begin to talk and, and give them the hope because the world is just trembling in fear right now and they're looking for answers. We need to keep the main thing the main thing. And the main thing is the souls of men. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. For God not, did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him they might be saved. But those that don't believe stand condemned already because he sent his only son. So let me tell you this. What does God care about more than anything? He cares about people. Oh, but you know, there's evil people. No, there's no such thing as evil people. There's people who do evil things. And not one of us could stand before a holy God and say, oh, you know what, I'm, I'm innocent. Not one of us. But there is a place where you can be completely cleansed of all sin, and that is faith in Jesus. We need to begin to look outside everywhere and begin to proclaim the number one thing. We need to make Jesus' last commandment our first priority right now. Time is short and it's time to get going.